Welcome to the Leadership Conversations podcast. I'm your host, Jono White. I'm the founder and principal consultant of Clarity. We are an Australian-based consultancy that works with leaders around the world, and our passion is to invest in people to become everything they're meant to be in order to fill the world with healthy organizations that people love to work for and customers line up to buy from. The goal of this podcast is to invest in you and your leadership. If you're just joining us for the first time, then feel free to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there. The most popular being our seven questions on leadership series. We've had more than 1,500 leaders from around the world in all different sectors give their in-depth answers on leadership, what books they love, what they found most challenging, uh, the most meaningful stories, how they how they structure their time through the day. That's free, so go and check it out. And we'd love to interview you about your leadership. I believe you have advice from your experience, your context, and your life so far that is important and can help other leaders. It's also a great way to give back. It's free to get involved, and you can do so by going to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest, or just Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form that pops up. We have a free resource for you on our website. It's called Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57 page ebook. It has interviews with 10 world class leaders, and you can go to consultclarity.org. It's right at the top and get that today. Uh, we also have a daily email that we send out to over 15,000 leaders, and that email contains the highlights, our best content from our podcasts, our blog, uh, my book, uh, the books that we're loving that are out there about leadership. It's also the best way to get access to our masterclasses and workshops before anyone else. And there's also exclusive and limited uh, special options just for subscribers. And you can subscribe by going to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe. Now my gift to you is to work incredibly hard to provide the best leadership content I can to invest in you and your leadership. So if you're finding our content helpful, if you find this podcast helpful, then your gift to me uh, could be this. If you, if you do find it helpful, then write a review or rate our content and make sure you subscribe or follow. I can't emphasize enough how helpful that is. It really does help us to get the word out there so we can invest in more leaders to become everything they're meant to be. It also means a lot to me personally when people like you and people in our community share our content on social media. So if you do that, then please do look for me, Jono White, to tag me and look to tag Clarity uh, on whatever platform you're on. And our team, including me, I, I'm always looking to see when people have mentioned us so that I can engage with you. And also we look at sharing content. So if you if you write something about something we've done, there's also a good chance we'll share that with our followers. So if you could do that, that is a massive, massive help as we try to invest in as many leaders as we can around the world. Last of all, you can check out my book about how to deal with difficult people even if you hate conflict. It's called Step Up or Step Out. It's available on Amazon. You can just look up Step Up or Step Out John O'White or you can go to store.consultclarity.org forward slash book and check it out there. I have coached leader after leader after leader and in more than 50% of the sessions, this topic comes up. How do I deal with this person? I'm finding it really difficult and, and I just want to find a way that doesn't blow up to do a really, just to have a difficult conversation, to lead them better. How do I do that? There's a three-step process that I outline in this book that I believe can help you. Okay, let's get into today's episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast. Enjoy. Welcome to another episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast. Today's guest is Felix Oberholzer G. Felix is a professor at Harvard University, and this is one of the conversations I've been looking forward to the most, actually. So uh, welcome, Felix. Thank you, Jenna. It's great to be here. Yeah, it's wonderful to chat. I, I really can't wait. Uh, first of all, for our listeners, can you give them a couple of things, a bit of a uh, a bit of an insight into who you are and what you do at Harvard and, and beyond, 
and uh, and then also what's a day in the life of Felix? That would that's a question I'd love for you to, <laughs> okay. for you to answer as well. Excellent. Yeah. So uh, as you pointed out, I'm a faculty member at Harvard University in the business school. Uh, in particular, I am in the strategy department uh, within the business school. I serve as chair of the strategy part department at this moment in time. So much of my research has to do with why is it that some companies are more, much more successful than others? Why is it that for some companies, success seems to be very sustainable? And then for other organizations, you always worry about, oh my God, what will the next week bring? What will the next month bring? <laughs> and this involves both doing original research, uh, but then op obviously often working with companies, working with students who are trying to learn strategic management. Yeah, fantastic. What an important, uh, important area. And I find that really fascinating. So I can't wait to chat about some of those things. What about a day in your life right now in 2022? What does that look like in your world, Felix? So we're in the middle of the teaching semester. So I usually uh, do most of my teaching in the spring. So I would typically get up in the morning. I have prepared the case conversations uh, in advance, but I will review my teaching plan. As you might know, one thing that's really special about Harvard Business School is that each session that we have with the students is focused on a particular case. And so imagine it's more a conversation than it is a lecture. I never really know what students will say. If I teach executives, I have no idea what the executives will say. And so it's almost like getting ready for a conversation that might go in many different directions. And part of that is, of course, uh, exciting and interesting. And part of that is also a little nerve wracking because you always worry about, oh, will people take away the right kind of insights, the right kind of lessons uh, from the case that we studied in that particular day. I uh, tend to work uh, late evenings. Uh, so most of my research uh, takes place takes place when it's dark outside. Oh, wow. That, that's, uh, that's really interesting. Um, so now let's find out a bit more about you and, and I guess about your story. I'd love for you to share some of the moments that really shaped you becoming who you are. Feel free to go back, you know, even to childhood. What, what are some of those moments as you look back that were really pivotal in shaping Felix to become the leader and, and the person you are today? I mean, one thing that's uh, perhaps interesting is that if if I could talk to my 20 year self, uh, that self would be very surprised that I ended up being an academic. I never really <laughs> I never really had ambitions to be an academic. I didn't really know my parents weren't academics. I didn't really know anyone. Now, let me think if that's I think that's really true yeah I didn't really know anyone who's an academic and so this is maybe more a reflection of the situation in, in Europe so I grew up in Switzerland and uh, what's less true now but back then in Switzerland if you wanted a great career a corporate career at some point in time you needed to go back to university and get your PhD uh, and you see it even today when you look at one of the big say car conferences and you look at the German executives it's always like professor this doctor that and that's just sort of part of becoming a corporate leader and so i did exactly this i i worked at a i worked at a bank and i went back to get my phd and then the very last semester right before i was done uh, we had a visitor from america and he said oh you know what you should do is you should come to america and you should teach in an mba program for a little while maybe you would like it I thought, yeah, maybe yes, maybe no. I have no idea what the life uh, of, of an instructor and an academic is like. And so uh, I moved to Philadelphia for uh, half a year. Uh, against all my expectations, they offered me a job. And so um, in a pretty surprising and interesting way, I, I now have of the career of an academic. I moved around a little bit, uh, yeah. essentially from Philadelphia North first to uh, Columbia University in New York and eventually uh, to Boston uh, where Harvard University is sort of against my weather preferences. I actually, I actually mm -hmm. really like warm weather, but somehow <laughs> my professional career takes me to colder and colder places. I guess Toronto would probably be next. Yeah. 
Well, we can always swap locations if you want, because I'm based in uh, in Brisbane in Australia, and I always laugh at the fact that I love colder weather. Although as an Australian, we don't oh, really do? understand. Yeah, we don't really know what cold weather is. Our winter is, you know, considered a summer in in some in some parts of the world. Yeah, but yeah. I'm always thinking, how is it that um, you know I'm always complaining about being hot, and I live in. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's we're right near the Gold Coast and these beautiful beaches where it's, you know, mm -hmm. it's hot nine yeah. months of the year. But yeah, I'm the opposite. I really love uh, love uh, the cold. And yet here I am in so Brisbane. I spent an hour shoveling snow this morning. So if you ever <laughs> feel like joining me, you, <laughs> that's, <laughs> you're, that's most, right. you're most welcome. <laughs> I can come and do a, a snow shoveling internship with uh, with Felix and, and get my yeah. have my dream of uh, of being in the cold. Um, it'll be uh, it'll be a short internship because there isn't that much to snow shoveling. Oh, really? <laughs> well, it's uh, as an academic for you. That, so that's so interesting that it wasn't necessarily the plan or the or the path, which is which is actually something I hear all the time on on the podcast, um, which I really love, is that people go, "Well, it wasn't linear. I didn't expect to be doing this, but uh, mm -hmm. but here I am." When did you? When did you sort of um, have your first big aha moment where you went, this is what I could do with my life? Like, this isn't just something I'm, I'm doing as a pathway to something else. This is, a, this is really something I want to invest my life in. Do you remember when you had a, uh, a particular, uh, as an academic, there was, there was a moment or there was a piece of research or what was it that when you really went, this is what I want to do? I think early on, there are some skills or some revelations about what you do well. You know how it's quite, it's quite difficult to know, like when you ask yourself when you're young, like what, what am I talented? What am I good at? That's like not an easy, not an easy question to answer. And so yeah. one of the things I noticed early on that is that I seem to be pretty good at explaining things. So this was true, you know, in a school context, but this was also true later uh, in in a corporate in a corporate environment, where sort of my ability to distill things, to explain things in really simple terms, I have now written a book about simple how simple strategy is. Uh, I think that's one of the skills that I think is is a really good skill to have as an educator in particular. And then I just love thinking about ideas, and mm. you know, academics obviously that's an ideas job. I have. I have 15 ideas a minute, things I could be doing, <laughs> interesting questions. Uh, like you, I have a podcast on the side. And part of the joy of doing that podcast just has to do with speaking with two of my colleagues and thinking about ideas, well, what businesses reveal by doing a particular set of things how you could how you could think more creatively about about business a particular industry or a particular country also so this a sort of a life that is rich with ideas i think i know i early, i know this early on that's really that's really interesting that's really interesting to me yeah fantastic um the question that comes to mind <laughs> because like you said you have so many ideas but if you were, you know, I think I said to you uh, when, or maybe when we when we chatted the other day, but the the idea of this podcast is really meant to be like you and I sit down uh, over a over a coffee in Boston or in Brisbane, and we just have a bit of a chat about your story and about leadership. And our listeners pull up a chair, order a coffee, and listen in. So if the three of us, you, me, and one of our listeners, were sitting down over a coffee, what what ideas right now in leadership and strategy? are you most excited about is there a particular I know that's a, that's a hard question but is there a particular idea or a particular element of your work right now that's really you're very excited about and and we can maybe chat a little bit about that yeah so i i would maybe mention two things one is if you think about companies today there's just a multitude of challenges so many things that are complicated your chat your supply chain is complicated mm. uh, the geography of business is complicated. There's social, there's social media, there's the talent war. And so one of the ideas is that 
it's very tricky and it's very dangerous actually if organizations get pulled in a million directions mm -hmm. and it's mostly out of goodwill you know it's like oh we see a new opportunity or we see a new challenge and we develop a strategy to address that particular challenge and so you end up with a global strategy and the supply chain strategy and a social media strategy and, it, and it's literally it leads to a situation where there's a million activities inside mm. the company but then when you look at the financial results they're often not that great and the question mm. is always like how can this be we have amazing people we have the best educated workforce in the history of humanity uh, we're all working really hard sometimes we're working really long hours and yet we don't quite have the success that one might imagine and so one of the key ideas that I've been researching, doing research on, that I've often spoke about this, this, this idea to, to radically simplify strategy, to do things better, but most importantly, to do fewer things. And this is something, I'm not sure how often you're in corporate environments, but this is something mm. that I always notice in particular when I'm with people who are, when I'm with people who are smart and who are ambitious. Like every meeting ends with, 18 more things that we should be doing, 52 <laughs> things we should be thinking about. And so somehow there's something about smart and ambitious people that they can probably do a million things at the same time. And then, you know, they don't get much sleep. And so that also helps. And then you're tempted to use that same model of success and superimpose it on organizations. And it works for individuals. Individuals can do many, many things at one and the same time, but organizations cannot. Mm. Organizations need to focus on a few things that really make a critical difference in creating value for customers or creating value for employees. And that is, frankly, a hard question as a leader, right? Because there's so much, so much is uncertain today. And so it can feel very good that you think, okay, I'm not sure if project A is going to be a success. I'm not really sure if project B is going to be a success. So let me try the following. Let me do a little bit of A and a little bit of B. And the trap that you fall into is that a little bit of A is not really A, and a little bit of B is also not really B. And so you have all of these activities, all of these projects that are sort of under-resourced, where people have to work just insane hours and really hard, and yet you don't have the success because you never really made up your mind. Uh, which one do you really want to do? Do you think it's going to be A or do you think it's going to be B? Mm. That is that is such a great summary of um, of the problem. What I'm just trying to think of uh, the next question to ask because that's such a rich sort of... Um, you just unpacked that so well. What, where have you seen, I guess, are there, are there any case studies um, of companies who have done, done it really well, who have radically simplified that are your favorite sort of examples of what that looks like in, in the real world? So um, one example that comes to mind is that just pretty astonishing turnaround of Best Buy. So Best Buy is mm -hmm. an electronics retailer in the States. And if you go back, say roughly 10 years, everybody is convinced that Best Buy is going to go out of business because they're competing with Amazon and Amazon, you know, not having, Best Buy has a thousand stores. Amazon has no stores to speak of. And so competing with Amazon just seemed impossible. Hmm. And then they get a new CEO, uh, Jolie Hubert, and he comes in and he basically implements two ideas. The first idea is instead of building big distribution centers, the way you typically do it in e-commerce, he starts shipping products from each of the 1,000 stores. And because these stores are really close to where people live, he beats Amazon in shipping times. And so that's mm. a beautiful example of creating more value for customers with mm. really just one, not, not a million ideas, not 15 ideas, just one really big idea. Because it turns out that electronics customers, they take, they take forever to decide what they want to buy. But then once they have decided they like to that they like to receive their products really, really fast. <laughs> and then on the supplier side, on the vendor side, he goes to Microsoft, he goes to Samsung and all these electronics vendors. And he says, well, you can go down the Apple route and you can build these really beautiful, amazing stores at a cost of millions and millions of dollars. Or you can have stores inside a store 
Uh, and then your products are right there where the customers are to begin with. And so he lowers the cost of these vendors. And as a result, there is more margin that you can now share with the vendors between Best Buy and uh, the suppliers. And so that alone is good enough. So at, before all of this starts, they, the losses are just, you know, really heavy losses, a billion and more per quarter. Wow. And they now have a return on invested capital of about 25% or so, which is just really, really successful. But what's really important to see is it's two really powerful ideas, but it's yeah. not a thousand things. Yeah, yeah. So, and and do you know how how they came up with those ideas? Do you have any insight into the process that Best Buy went through? One of the things that is really critical is that you see the world through the lens of your customers yeah. or you see the world through the lens of your employees. And I think in the case of customers, that's not so unusual, right? Almost, almost every company I have ever worked with, uh, they talk about customer centricity and they try to do what the mm. customer wants. I think it's a, interestingly, it's a little more unusual for employees. I'll give you one, <laughs> one current example. Sometimes yeah. when I talk with executives about the current pandemic, uh, they would say, you know, one of the big realizations is employees really like flexibility. They really like to work from home. And <laughs> I think this is always so funny because people were shouting at the top of their lungs that they wanted more flexibility prior to the pandemic, except we didn't really listen. <laughs> and so this is now a realization where you're forced to do something that you always thought, well, well, it can't really work and you have to be in the office and all the rest of it. But it's also a good example how truly listening to employees and truly trying to make the business work uh, in a manner that is really preferred by them. Mm. Uh, I think that's, that's sort of, if you ask me, is there more room for improvement on the customer side or is there more room for improvement on the employee side? I would say on average for an average company, it's probably the employee side. Wow. How do you, uh, how do you listen? Well, well, no, no, that not, that's not even the question. How do you change your perspective to see truly what it's like in your customer's shoes and in your employee's shoes? Cause that's something for me, even with my uh, you know, with my clients I work with, I find that really hard. And, uh, and, and I've, I try a lot of things. I do a lot of feedback, but I, I feel like oh, I still, I know there's things I'm not getting. I just want to have that aha moment of what it would be like in one of my client's shoes. How did, how can um, companies do that really well? One of the recommendations that I make is to think of, so say in conversations with employees, think of employees, not first and foremost as employees, think of them just as people. Uh, yeah. What's their day like? How does it start? How does it end? Uh, and then what's the role of being employed by your company in all of this? And one of the things that you might discover is that, you know, maybe work is completely fine. It's working well. And I actually like to be at work. But boy, oh boy, my commute is sheer torture. And you ask me to be at 9 a.m. in the office when everybody else has to be in the office at 9 a.m. And so if you were more relaxed about that, everything would change for me. Maybe you really like wearing the uniform that you wear at work. And maybe this is like the worst part of your day when you have to wear again this uniform. Maybe you have some anticipation about what's going to happen when you make a mistake. Maybe your boss will yell at you, maybe, and so on and so on. So just, just think about the person as a person and less the person as an employee first and foremost. Give you one example yeah. where this has actually worked really well. The Gap ran an experiment a little while ago where they, you know, if you're a retail worker in the United States, it's actually really hard to be in retail. And some of the problems have nothing to do with the work in the store, but you know your shift only about two weeks in advance and your shifts, the number of shifts that you get vary dramatically from week to week, depending on footfall, depending on did the delivery come in, did it not come in? And that creates a lot of stress in people's lives because your income goes up and down from week to week. Sometimes you get many shifts, sometimes you don't. And then since you never really know in advance, it's really hard to plan. So they do this super simple thing 
they use an app that allows employees to trade shifts. You know, my daughter's sick or my daughter has a concert, so I cannot be at work. As a result, I make my shift available to someone else who really wants to work. And then so sometimes towards the end of the month, I want extra shifts. So I'm picking up more work from others. What they find is that store productivity increases by more than 10 percentage points. And then <laughs> sales, same store sales increase. But the best thing of this is, in particular, if you're a parent with children, people mm. report that they sleep much better. Why? Mm. Because life is not as stressful as it used to be. And so think of both on the customer side, but also on the employee side, think really holistically about what that life is like. You know, you do have lots of innovation exercises, like a minute in the life of some person where you follow someone minute by minute by minute by minute. And you're yeah. asking, is there an opportunity for us to add value to that particular moment in your life? Mm. And thinking of employees as people, I have found is a really, is a really powerful way to discover ever better ways to add value to being an employee at an organization. That's wonderful. Think about think about employees as people and and view what view their life holistically and see what you can do as a company to actually not just say are they enjoying their work? Yes, but realize if if they report back and if you find out the commute is a is a nightmare, it's the worst part of their day. How can you do something about that? Um, that's that's yeah. so good. Yeah. And interactions with leadership, sort of this question, what happens if you make a mistake? That's, of course, super important. If you look at surveys, this is data for the United States. I'm not sure if this is true for Australia, but in the United States, when people switch their jobs, the yeah. most important reason that they give is their boss. <laughs> it's the relationship with their immediate boss that somehow it didn't work out. And so thinking about these relationships and thinking about how you manage the team or how you manage the big company that you manage, that's so super important. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I love the idea of simplifying strategy. And I think I'm just thinking about the people I've worked with and, and the leaders I know who might be listening, uh, scratching their heads going, uh, how, how do you actually do that? Because it's one thing, some people might've tried to do this before and then they look, they get a year down the track and go, somehow we simplified it and then ended up right back where we were. So we didn't really simplify it. How do you actually simplify strategy to really nail down a couple of ideas and then stick with them? Yep. So there's two things that are really important. The first is it's not just a good idea. Right? It has to be a good idea relative to what the competition does. And so as always in strategy, we think in differences, nothing is really terrible or nothing is really great. All that always matters is, are you different from the competition? And different from the competition also in the sense that not just the insiders understand the differences. You know, when you're when you're in a store, you look at any, say, like breakfast cereal. So you look at the breakfast cereal aisle. If you work for a cereal company, all you see is differences because you're an expert. You really understand, understand all the small differences across all the products. If you're like me, I walk in there and I just see like a wall of breakfast cereals and they all seem roughly the same. And so having this perspective of, what I choose to do and where I choose to stand out has to be something that, that, is a, that is a real difference in the eyes of customers or in the eyes of employees. And then the tool that I would recommend is something called a value map. And in this book that I uh, recently published, Better Simpler Strategy, uh, the last third of the book or so, I think is all about strategy implementation and introduces you to these value maps. What's amazing about a value map is it literally shows you at a glance, what's the competitive landscape and what are my strategic opportunities. The mm. maps also help you not to fall in this trap that you're trying to catch up with the competition, right? So that's yeah. often one intuition we have. We see some other company do something really interesting, something really amazing. And next thing we say, oh, maybe we should also. Just like, <laughs> you know, everybody's copying TikTok now. Uh, where will this lead to? Well, this will lead to enormous margin pressure on all the businesses because the moment you're the same, 
then of course, all that matters is prices. And if all that matters is prices, your margins will shrink over time. Yeah. And so if I only had two hours with a company, I would always do a value map. It's a fun exercise. It's quite simple to do. And it really allows you to do what's really hard. What's the one or two things? What are the one or two dimensions where you want to stand out? A good question to ask is always imagine your organization is no longer around tomorrow. You're gone. Mm -hmm. Who's going to miss you? Who's going to say, oh my God, remember when they existed? That was really amazing. <laughs> if no one misses you, you're not really making a difference. And you know, there's lots of opportunities, right? So maybe Maybe employees miss you, maybe customers miss you, but someone has to miss you. And if no one misses you, you definitely haven't figured it out. Mm, that's a great question. If you weren't around tomorrow, who would, who would miss you? Um, can you talk us through how to, and, and I know uh, you probably go into more detail on the value mapping process in your book. Is that right? Oh, you just broke up a little. Oh, sorry. It, it, you go through how to do a value map in the book. Is that right? Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. It's yes. described in some detail has practical examples also. Beautiful. Can you give us a little introduction to that process? I just think I heard you unpack it and I'm sitting, you know, I'm sitting here desperate to know how to do it. So I figure listen, <laughs> listeners okay. are probably wanting to uh, maybe just to get a bit of a start on, on how to do that process, Felix. Yes. So the two key variables that influence strategy and then lead to financial success are the customer's willingness to pay and the employee's willingness to sell. And let me explain willingness to pay. I think that's a little easier. Uh, that's the most the customer would ever willing to pay. And when we do a value map, we essentially ask, what are the value drivers that create a particular willingness to pay? So for instance, I don't know about you. I have a hard time waking up in the morning. I really need that first cup of coffee. My <laughs> willingness to pay seven or eight dollars easily. Now, what are the components? The components is the flavor of the coffee. How close is the coffee shop to my home? Uh, how hot is it? I probably think about the service in the coffee shop and so on and so on. So these are all called value drivers. Yeah. And when you do a map, you rank order these value drivers from most important to least important. And each of these, you ask yourself, how well do we do? Do we really provide great flavors? Are we really close to where customers want us to be? Do we have great service? And so on and so on. And you do this exercise both for your company and for the competition. And mm. so that basically now illustrates in a really beautiful way where you stand out, where you do a better job than the competition and where you fall short. And you can then start thinking about how would you evolve your value proposition over time? One of the things that I really like about this process is strategy can sometimes be unhelpful if it's sort of on a white sheet of paper kind of strategy. Yeah. You know, we could, we could be anything if only we wanted to. That's not really true for any company. Mm. We always need to start with where we are today. And mm. so that's exactly where the, what the value map process does. It takes the current competitive position. It shows you opportunities that you have. And then, frankly, the, the real key to, to, to successful strategic decision making is creativity. Sometimes I think people have this idea that strategy is complicated. It's only reserved for the most senior people in the organization. Uh, not everyone can be a strategist. And all of this is not right. Uh, everybody, everybody can be a strategist and conceptually speaking, strategy is not complicated, but really where the rubber hits the road is, can you be creative about how you want to double down on the value drivers where you have a competitive advantage? So it's a process that involves a lot of creativity, that it's a process that involves a lot of creativity, a lot of imagination, and that's really what sets the best companies apart from the rest. So how do you know the difference between which, uh, which value drivers are most important to customers and which ones you have competitive advantage in? Like, how do you, how, when you're working with a company, how do you look at those things? And are there any common pitfalls people make when they're doing a value map where you have to go, no, 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 no. That's, that's a common <laughs> trap. <laughs> yeah. So uh, a few things. 
everything in value-based strategy is data-driven. There's no room for anecdotes or you know maybe company internal narratives. So the data for the value map come from your customers. If you make a customer value map, the yeah. data for uh, an employee value map come from your employees, and they they will tell you these value drivers are important. Uh, these value drivers are not so important. And they frankly will also <laughs> tell you where you do well and you know where you where you don't do so well. Uh, two things to keep in mind. The first one is. If you just go out to customers and you ask them, what would you like? Uh, you will get really unhelpful answers. They'll basically come back and say, we want everything and we want it for free, which That's is not right. exactly useful in you know, trying right. to develop a strategy. Yeah. So one technique that I often use is I, I have from qualitative research, I have a list of potential value drivers. And then I ask people to allocate 100 points to these value drivers. Uh, indicating their relative importance. And so, because it's only a hundred points, mm. I'm now forcing you to make these trade-offs so that you can say, I want everything and I want it at a really low price. That's yeah. one among several techniques that I describe in the book, how to do it. And then the second thing to think about is everybody knows their view of the competition, but that's mm. irrelevant. What matters mm. is not your view of the competition. What matters is your customer's view of the competition. Yeah. And that's usually when, when I work with companies and there's pieces of data that are missing, that's usually the weak spot. We know where the competition is great. We know where the competition is not so fabulous, but we don't really know the perception of the customers what they do well, what they don't do so well. And so it's worth investing in those kinds of data because as I said earlier, in strategy, everything is different, is driven by differences. And so you want to know the difference in customer perceptions uh, between you and your competitor. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, well, what, I, what I'd love to do, Felix, I feel like um, we're just scratching the surface, chatting around your book. So maybe down the track, it'd be great to have you back for a part two and uh, perhaps we can yes. we can dig a bit deeper into this just because um, there I have so many more questions, but I think it's a great point for listeners to to go and uh, and check out the check out your book and uh, and and go and read that because I know it's uh, definitely going very high up on my list of of books to read because I I think it's uh, I think it's incredibly important. And uh, so before we before we wrap up though, let's just do Leadership Express. I've just got a few questions. Are you ready? Okay. Yes. <laughs> so apart from your well, book, I will find out, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. You'll find out. Uh, apart from your book, what's uh, what's a book that you've gifted a lot to other people? I think two books. Uh, one is, uh, is a novel. Uh, it's set in, in China. Mm. Uh, and the title of the book is don't say we have nothing. It's an amazing book. It's beautifully written by Madeline Tien. Uh, but it's also an amazing account that makes you think about what it was like to live in China in the last 60, 70 years or so. Really a humanizing story, which I find particularly important now at a time of geopolitical tensions, when we sometimes have trouble seeing other people, where we see other countries and other powers, but not really the people behind these powers. So that's a book that I've often given. Um, in terms of business books, probably the book that I've given most often is a book by my colleague, Yang Mi Moon, called Different. And it teaches you where these differences that are so important in strategy, where they come from, how you discover them, why it is that sometimes giving less is better than giving more. Uh, and again, I guess I'm, I'm drawn to books that are, that are beautifully written, and hers, hers definitely is that. Wonderful. They're two brilliant recommendations. Um, any great podcasts you're listening to, it'd be great for you to mention the podcasts that you have as well for people to go and check out, but also any others that you're listening to right now? Yeah, so the podcast that I'm on is called After Hours. And so the idea is very similar to your idea, except we're not uh, meeting over coffee, we're meeting over drinks. So it's a little <laughs> later. It's yeah. a little later in the day. And what we wanted to do is, you know, you teach. And so many students and many executives who come to Harvard, 
they experience you as an instructor but yeah. there is no waste time and there is no waste room to experience all the instructors as individuals and so sort of what we model is we're three friends and literally like what's the conversation like when we meet uh, after hours to talk about business to talk about culture and it's uh, we try to have a really lively exchange about things that are of interest things that are of interest to us so that's one that i would that i would highly recommend Excellent. Uh, i like uh, checks and balance that's an economist podcast yeah uh, that one's particularly interesting uh, in part because the Economist being British, and then there's the New York Bureau chief, who's also on the podcast, sort of having a more uh, United States view of the world and what's going on. And the conversation is both is both funny, uh, really interesting. And then maybe the last one I mentioned is a podcast called The World, uh, which is an amazing wrap up of world stories that I'm not sure about Australia media, but in the US media tends to focus on a few countries if yes. if, there's, <laughs> if there's news about abroad uh it's usually news about you know the usual suspects and yes. the world is really amazing at ma making you listen to local voices mm. from continents that you don't hear often about and from countries that you don't often hear about what's going on in Ethiopia at this at this moment in time uh what what's it like to live in the western part of Turkey at this point in time and so on and so on so I really the world I think is a is a very is a fabulous podcast as well so That's many good ones excellent. to choose right There's there just are <laughs> oh no, they're wonderful recommendations. Though I'm definitely going to um, uh, add a couple of those to my to my list because I, I I've been looking for something like that. So thank you for sharing that. Um, what's a great piece of advice you've received? When I first started teaching, there was someone who observed a very senior person at the university who observed one of my classes, and. Uh, he said, oh, you'll be fine. You know, at some point in time, you'll be an effective instructor. Your one challenge is going to be to trust the students. And mm -hmm. at the time when I got the advice, I didn't really quite understand what he meant. Yeah. But I think over time, it's really grown on me. And I have, it's one of the most wonderful experiences in the classroom. So imagine you talk about some company and there's like a little bit of a conversation going back and forth and people have different views. And then someone says something that just makes no sense to you. Yes. And of course your first response might be, this is not right, or this is not a productive way to think about the problem at hand. And what I've learned over time, this is both true in the classroom, but this is also true in corporate meetings, is the, really the best attitude to have is, here's a smart person uh, with good intentions, and he or she just said something that is not something that I would ever have thought, that I think at this moment in time, it's got to be wrong. But of course, there is a kernel of truth somewhere. There's mm. something interesting about it. Otherwise, this smart and experienced person wouldn't share this view. And when you then go into those conversations with the mindset of my job really is to figure out where this person comes from. Like, is there maybe some hidden assumption that I'm making and that she's not making? Is there uh, some logic that I never thought about? Is there an ex a sense of experience that I'm not sharing with, with him that then illuminates why a person has a particular worldview? So really, really sort of this have recognizing good intentions and then following through even if you think oh my god we will end up in a really terrible place because this the this is the worst piece of advice that i've heard in a long time you will just be surprised by how much you learn <laughs> i love that advice and i think that's great and i think it's and it's a um it takes a self-awareness and that's what I love about that advice is to actually realize <clears throat> when you have that initial reaction of that's wrong, I find for myself, you, you don't question it. You just go, Oh, that's wrong. Um, yeah. And so yeah. you're straight on to the next thing, how you're going to explain it or how you're going to, you know, politely move on. And, and it's actually questioning the that's wrong thought and going, well, wait a second, that's, that might be my initial reaction, but 
how can I, there's probably something in there that I'm not understanding. Well, there always is. There'll be something I'm not understanding. If I can search that out. Um, I think, I think a lot of teams can work better together by having that sort of attitude. If you have mm -hmm. everyone on the team. So that's uh, yeah, that's really wonderful advice. Next question, a movie or TV show that really impacted you? Oh, movies is an impossible, is an impossible list. I, I love, I love movies in, in general. I think I'm mostly attracted to sort of movies that, that tell a personal story. Yeah. Uh, movies that make me see things, something that I haven't, I haven't really seen before. I never really, I never really thought about it that much. So uh, anything, anything that is, that is sort of teaching me something that I didn't, that I didn't know before uh, is, is super, is super appealing to me. If I had to give an example, I think Shadow is an amazing film that is, that I think taught me taught me a lot about sort of the the visuals that come with sort of sun and shadow it's 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 beautifully shot it's it's really it's a, a really amazing an amazing movie and there are many there are many others of course um i love comedy shows in in general i find you you learn a lot by listening <laughs> by listening to uh comedy uh, Mohammed Amer is is a Palestinian uh, comedian who lives in Texas. He yeah. has a, he has a new Netflix special that I would highly recommend. It's it, it talks about the pandemic and people's experience during the pandemic, mm. and it's this he captures. You know how at various points in time during the pandemic you go through these moments where you think, oh my god, it's amazing, it's all over, and we're <laughs> going to be okay and we're going to go back to having a normal life yeah. and then you also learn that nah actually not really we're going we seem to be going backwards and he had he had he himself had COVID twice during during oh, this wow. time and he yeah. sort of like this should I be happy that it's ending should I be frustrated should I be depressed that it was such a difficult time he captures that moment in a way that is just absolutely fantastic so those are those are two that i would really recommend yeah thank you there that's uh I'll, I'll go and watch that that's fantastic i always enjoy asking uh leaders and thought leaders that question because uh about movies and tv shows and and shadow is that the movie that's um uh like a action uh, or a war yes action yeah. war movie from 2018 exactly. yeah yes okay. exactly wonderful yeah. yeah thank you yeah. that's a great recommendation yeah. i think you would you, you will you will really like it and then, of course, you know, short for actually probably my media consumption is not maybe dominated, but a big part of it is just short form content, which is I mean, I like I love I love TikTok. I think it's an amazing it's an amazing company uh, with amazing content that really what I love best when you think about Instagram being sort of the beautiful part of life, but it's also you know, set in scene in a particular way. Mm. Uh, the creativity that comes from TikTok and what the ideas that people have, it's just like, it's its just the best part of being human. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a great thought. Um, last question, if you were, and you, you said something about this before, that if you were sitting down consulting with a company, your value map would be one of the first things you do. But what about a young leader? If you were sitting down over a cup of coffee with a young leader, just starting out in their first role where they were really had the chance, you know, to, to really get their, uh, you know, to really bite into doing strategy and leading people, what would be one piece of advice you'd give them? I think the ambition of young leaders in particular is often success. Obviously, you know, you think, oh, oh, I'm going to lead a team and I don't know, we increase sales or we develop an amazing product. And that's natural to do, I think, to think about the output. But one thing that matters much more than, you know, how successful the team is, if you can every day at the end of the day, if you can think about, is there someone who was better off as a result of your interactions with this person today. That I think is an amazing, 
ambition to have. And it could be one person, it could be a team, it could be, but at the end of every day, you want to think back and you want to say, I made someone stay better. I helped someone improve. I helped someone see things in a, in a more positive light. Uh, because in the end, that's really what leadership is about, right? You're, you're in mm. service to others, yeah. making their lives, making their careers, making their ambitions uh, come, come true. That's wonderful advice. And yeah, that is what it's all about. Uh, for those who uh, want to find you online and, and um, the podcast you mentioned before, again, is After Hours. Uh, can you just mention again the book for those who want to jump on and, and grab that right now? Yes. So the title of the book is Better or Simpler Strategy, and you will find it wherever you find books. Better, simpler strategy. Wonderful. Such a good name and, uh, and just such a good idea. It's, I think it's, I can't think of many things more important for those leaders out there um, doing anything in leadership than, and I guess that's why you're so passionate about it, but I also would just echo that. I think it's, um, it's at the core of, of so many other issues we could talk about is, is coming back to that. So I, I love, I love that you're, uh, that you've written that and it's been, it's been so exciting. What about um, if people want to find you online, LinkedIn, et cetera, is there um, through Harvard, is there any way that people can connect with you online, Felix? Yes. So I'm on LinkedIn. I'm most active on LinkedIn. Uh, so it, I'm easy. I'm easy to find. Uh, and I'm always happy to interact with everyone who's there as well. Wonderful. Well, thank you to our listeners for tuning in. Uh, today, I know, is going to be one of the favorite episodes of listeners because this has just been mind-blowing for me. I love strategy, but I'm walking away with um, wheels turning in my head, um, questioning about how I do things and clients, and it's been really great. I, I love that. So for our listeners, don't forget, I also have the John O'White Leadership Podcast and the Leadership Question of the Day podcast where I put a stone in your shoe with a different question every day for you around your leadership. Um, but I want to finish today by saying a massive thank you to Felix for sharing so openly and uh, just such wisdom. It's just been, um, I, I guess it, it might sound um, uh, funny, but uh, I, chatting with you today for me has made me go, Oh, well, that makes perfect sense. You do what you do <laughs> because <laughs> you have articulated <laughs> such a big area of company and organizational strategy. It, you've just, you've explained it so simply and I'm walking away with things I want to go and, and start working on and things I'm going, Oh, I can see now that that issue over there, that's because I've been trying to do too much there. And so it's, it's just been a joy uh, for me to chat with you, Felix. And, and I know people, yeah. it will have helped a lot of listeners. So thank you so much for being so generous with your time. Thank you for having me, John. It was such a pleasure to speak with you. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast as much as I did. If you're joining us for the first time, don't forget to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there, including our seven questions on leadership series. We've had more than 1,500 leaders from all over the world in all different roles, in different industries, answer these seven questions on leadership and leaders give these in-depth answers around how they spend their time, uh, a book that's been significant for them. It's just a gold mine. It's completely free to access. So go to consultclarity.org and look for that. We'd also love to interview you about your leadership. I believe your experience, your life, your context means that you have advice on leadership that other leaders can learn from. Yes, you, if you're going, not me. Well, no, I really believe you would have something to add. So if you're looking for a way to give back, it's completely free to get involved. And we would love to interview you through the seven questions on leadership. You just go to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest or Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form and get involved. We have a free resource on our website called the Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57 page ebook, 10 world-class leaders giving their thoughts on leadership and that's completely free. It's available on our homepage consultclarity.org right at the top. So make sure you go and get that and download it today. 
And we have a free daily email that you can subscribe to. We send this out to over 15,000 leaders from around the world. And uh, it contains the highlights of content from our podcasts, our blogs, um, our books, books we're reading. It's got the best content and it gives you exclusive, limited, early access to our masterclasses, workshops, new products, special offers. It's all for our subscribers. You can go to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe and join 15,000 other leaders. And you know, my gift to you is to work really hard, particularly through the Leadership Conversations podcast. I have been blown away by the quality of the leaders and I'm learning as much as anyone in doing these interviews. So I, I'm having a great time. And my gift to you is to keep lining up the best leaders I can to invest in your leadership. Your gift to me, if you're finding this helpful, there is something that you could do that would help us out massively. And that is to write a review and to leave a rating for our podcast or wherever you're watching or listening to this. I can't tell you how much that helps us out. Also subscribe or follow. It really does make a difference in helping us to help more leaders become everything they're meant to be. Another thing that means a lot to me personally is when I see our community share our content. So if you do share this or any other piece of content on social media, then thank you and, and please do that. And look for me, John White or Clarity and tag us in your post. Our team is always looking for posts to engage with from our community. And there's also a chance that we'll share your content uh, to go beyond and share it with our followers. Last of all, you can check out my book. It's called Step Up or Step Out, How to Deal with Difficult People Even If You Hate Conflict. I wrote this book because 50% of the coaching sessions I have with leaders, this topic comes up again and again and again. And it's this idea of how do I have this difficult conversation? How do I lead this person better when I'm finding them difficult? Or in some cases you look and you say, I think I might be leading a difficult person. They're just quite difficult to lead or I'm finding them quite difficult to lead. So there's a three-step process that I unpack in step up or step out. And the amazing thing, and I've literally done this myself and I've heard it anecdotally from other leaders as I've coached them, is that if you follow this process, you will see that person step up and change their behavior or make a decision, which is to step out some of the time. 95% uh, of the time, people will step up or step out in just four weeks. And I stand by that. It's uh, You have to read the book to understand, but uh, I really do believe in it and I've experienced it firsthand. It works. So you can go to Amazon, look up Step Up or Step Out John O. White or store.consultclarity.org forward slash book. Well, thank you so much for listening. We're going to be back with a new episode next time of the Leadership Conversations podcast. And I hope today has helped you to take another step towards becoming the leader you're meant to be. See you next time.